I'm Kieran Jethro, a chef and restaurateur in Kenya. Contrary to popular belief, Africa has rich and vibrant food. My mission to place this continent on the culinary map. In this series, I'm leaving East Africa behind, heading south to discover exotic flavors and world-class produce. I'll meet some fascinating characters and explore their unique methods of harvesting food. He's got one. It's escargot on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> if it's edible, we can make it taste good. I think we hit the mother load, Calvin. It is really good, lunch. Very, very tasty. Africa is one of nature's greatest food stores, packed full of amazing ingredients. Africa is my bush larder. These lions are right at home behind the fences of the Nkazi Game Reserve in South Africa. But they're few in number, which means other game animals can thrive in this stunning wilderness. But the area can become overpopulated, meaning land management is a necessary process. In this episode, I'll be marveling at the production of South Africa's dried meat known as biltong. About a ton of meat. A ton these of meat a week. Can't keep up with it. <laughs> Take a bush walk in the Nkazi area for some hard to find and tough to eat edible roots. Not a lot of it. We're going to need to forage for a week. <laughs> It's a little bit like eating wood. <laughs> Attempt to harvest some delicious impala meat. They compete. The only way to do it is to harvest. He's got one. And finally, cook a belly-busting game meal for my new friends. Delicious. Just like perfect venison. Good night. Here we go, do they? <laughs> I'm on my way to the town of Hoodsprey, which lies in the Lowfelt, about 350 kilometers north of Johannesburg. Here, biltong is a popular and delicious snack, and one of my all-time favorites. I'm actually overwhelmed at how many different varieties there are, and I am hungry. Which is the most popular of all these? The most popular one is just a normal, uh, traditional mm -hmm. biltong. Normal biltong. Yeah. Let me take 100 grams of the normal biltong so I can taste it. In fact, you can give me 200 grams. It's 200 grams. Thank you, my dear. All right, let me try that. Mm. Very, do you like biltong? Yes, I do. Mm. You want a piece? Yes. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. It's absolutely fantastic stuff. Thank you. Subtly salty, moist. I mean, if you look around here, there's so many different dry horse biltongs. So it's taken it on to a whole different level here. I'm very, very impressed. I'm very happy. Teresa, cheers. Absolutely delicious. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Cheers. Biltong is cured and dried in many of Hoodsprey's commercial butcheries. I've arranged to meet Fani, whose biltong production is on an epic scale. So I'm here at Boschfeld Butchery. Boschfeld? Boschfeld. Boschfeld Butchery. Boschfeld, Boschfeld Butchery. You guys sell a lot of biltong, don't you? A lot. About a ton of meat that we hang in, uh, in a week. A oh, ton of meat a week? Yeah. So South Africans eat a lot of biltong in, in Hoodsprey. Can't keep up with it. <laughs> but you also do a lot of game meat as well? Okay. If it's time for hunting season or whatever, we do a lot of venison. Because a lot of the areas here cull, cull their animals, and, yeah. and they, do they bring you the culled meat? They bring it in, and sometimes if they don't have permits and stuff, we go out to them. Because there's that red line area where you're yeah. not allowed to bring the meat out. Yeah. So you go and cure it for them? Yeah. So we're just going to go into the coolers here, which are also full of all sorts of things. OK, here's yeah, some of the beef meat that we have. What we're going to use today is the silver side, what we usually use to make molten out of. How long do you, are you aging this stuff for? It must be aged for two weeks. OK, yes. 14 yes. days. Four, yeah. This is all beef, and that's pig. This is all beef hanging here. And then I have some giraffe lying over there. Some giraffe under there. Yeah. That is about, if I look at it like that, roughly about 400 kilos. But as built on, people enjoy the giraffe Yeah, it's very on? good. Meat everywhere, I love it. All right, let's go <laughs> turn this thing into some biltong. So you cut across the grain, huh? Yeah. The grain of the meat is going like that, and finally it's cutting across it as opposed to cutting with it, which makes a lot of sense when you eat it. It's a lot easier to eat. And you don't trim out the fat or anything like that. You just, no, it's all, just it all goes just in, Just huh? like that. Yeah, look at that. Finally weighs the meat to work out how much spice he needs to cure it. Do you make it yourself? No, because you don't have to use Worcester sauce or vinegar in it, and it's a very delicious sauce. It has some crystals in it. Often when people make biltong, you use a, a blend of spices plus vinegar and Worcester sauce and various things to really get that flavor in. Finally, spice doesn't require that. It's got crystals that melt when they go in the fridge that do the same work and sort of vinegar or, or Worcester sauce would do. Do you know what's in this? Definitely some coriander in it. it looks like there's black pepper as well. No, no, that's the crystals that you see. Okay, the super secret built on spice. Now it must go into the fridge at least for one day, and then every time you just go in the fridge, you just give it a 10 so that the spice can go through the meat nicely. 
So it's really quite simple. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so you can see it's really, after a day, really wet. Yeah, it is. And that's the, the spice it's drawing out all the Yeah, all and the, the crystals moisture. that has been melted and everything. So then from here, it just goes and gets hung and dried. Yeah. Yeah, I have some beef lotong that's been hung about two days now. If it stays on this rack here, yeah, it's about two to three days. Because of the fans? Yeah, well, as you can see, we have some drivers and stuff. I mean, one of the things about South African biltong, which is fantastic, is that it's still quite moist. A lot of the biltong you'll eat is like chewing a shoelace. It's fantastic stuff. You never eat biltong, you're missing out. Well, funny, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Can't believe you sell a thousand kilos a week. That's absolutely insane. Cheers, bud. Okay. Thanks, Thanks bud. Now that I've seen how this delicious biltong is made, I'm heading 30 kilometers east to the Mkazi Reserve in the Timbavati area. Here is where I hope to harvest my impala. Impala are one of South Africa's most abundant antelope, which is why their population must be controlled. But first, I need some wild accompaniments. I'm meeting bush guide George and botanist Judy, who are going to take me on a late afternoon bushwhack. Hello, George. How are you, mate? I'm fine. And Judy. Hi, Judy. How are you? Good to meet you. Judy and George are both sort of experts in the area. George, you, you were born here. This is, this is where you're from. Yeah, all my life. Between Judy and George, we're going to go on a nice long bushwalk and try and uncover anything that's edible or fragrant, you know, could be used in any way, shape, or form to be thrown into a pot. It doesn't take long before George has found something edible. What, what have we got here? Just these berries. And they're lovely to taste. George, who showed you that you can eat this? How do you know you um, can eat it? A long time ago. When you were a kid? Yeah. You always used to just eat them? Yeah, well. Oh, my goodness. Very sweet. Yeah. Look at them. Tiny. Each berry has one large seed in it. And the pulp around it is really juicy and extremely sweet. They're absolutely delicious. George, what, what's the name of this in Shangan? Uh, Duobe. Bloody good, whatever you, however you say it. George and Judy are a fountain of knowledge and know of many more berries found in this incredible landscape. There's the white berry. White berry? Yes, good, taste good. Um, so its real name is Curiniga verosa. Certainly at least we've got something that we can eat this mm. year. This really is fruiting. Go on, mate, get stuck in. Have a white berry on me. Thank you. <laughs> it's very sweet. And bitter. And then when you chew the seeds, that's the bitter bit. Mm. It's nice and sweet, like a little pearl of sort of sugar in your mouth. George has something else up his sleeve, a bush root that is tough to dig up. It's quite a big spade, George. <laughs> like this, you can eat it? I, I will try that. It's the most tender thing I've ever eaten in my life. It's a little bit like eating wood. <laughs> when you first chew it, obviously you can't eat that, but you get the water, and it's quite sweet. I mean, it's very starchy, so there's obviously sort of sugars in it. I wonder what would happen if you tried cooking it. Can no. you? You can't cook it. No. And I guess what you look for is thorns and these red berries. Yeah. Not, not a lot we can do with it, but very interesting nonetheless. It isn't long before we run into some creepy crawlies. Arachnophobic should look away now. That's a golden orb, but it's pretty small this year. Silk of this spider is one of the strongest in the world. I believe so, yeah. And I can literally pull the whole tree with it. Very, very strong. <laughs> these spiders are known to trap birds, but that's nothing when compared to the power and strength of the mighty buffalo one of Africa's most dangerous animals. Those things, when you're walking around a place like this, are probably your biggest problem. Buffaloes do a lot of damage to people. As we continue, the reserve comes to life, and it was extraordinary to see just how many species of animals thrive here. Judy explains to me how land management in the reserve is a necessary process. By the sheer numbers, impala are doing very, very well. Yeah, there are um, lots of them around. Perhaps at the expense of some of the other species, management has to take place. It doesn't matter how big the area is, big or small, you still have to intervene to some extent. Culling is probably one of the uh, most well-used ways, and it's something where other people can benefit. Well, basically, at the end of it, you get a whacking load of delicious meat. So it can't be that bad. No. This is an interesting little forb, another term for a herb. OK. It smells a little bit like aniseed, a little bit like lemon. It's like lavender, lemon, aniseed. Yeah. And there is a, a little bit of basil on the end of it. It's like a mix of about five or six different herbs. It's absolutely astonishing. Right. We have to try it in cooking. There's the wild spinach. Wild spinach yeah. with a yellow, little yellow flower. Yeah. Not a lot of it. And yeah, I guess you just cook the leaves, pick them off and... And the flowers. And, even and the, the flowers as well, yeah. even the stems as well. Yeah. So we're going to need to forage for a week <laughs> to get enough of this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> we are. It's amazing, all the different places you go, I always find some sort of spinach that is nothing like spinach we know. It'd be interesting to try it there. Well then, George. It's been a successful afternoon, and I found some new and unusual accompaniments for my dish, just the way I like it. All I need now is the star prize. 
So the next morning, George and I meet JC, a professional gamekeeper who's going to help me find an impala. Hello, JC. Nice to meet you, bro. And JC is a professional hunter. That's what he does for a living. Yeah, pretty much for a living. Do you carry that thing everywhere you go? Most of the time when you're out in the bush. Yeah, yeah you'll have to. Not to the supermarket there. No. Maybe you could explain to us, JC, why it's sensible or progressive to, you know, to harvest animals in a confined area like this. Like Impala is a grazer and a browser. So yes. they're basically a mixed feeder. Yeah. So they compete. We determine the optimal carrying capacity that uh, in a specific area with all the game that's present. So and basically the only way to do it is to harvest the game. I mean, like JC says, you know, nothing goes to waste. The skins are used, meat, particularly of an Impala, absolutely delicious. I mean, really, it's fantastic. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of a, a win-win. JC's gonna let me have a couple of shots with this and see if I can just get an appreciation for how difficult it is to actually hit something. Down there, there's a, there's a plastic bottle about 30, 40 meters away. When it comes down to the, the real business, JC will be doing that. Pull the trigger, close the bolt. I'm just gonna stand on that side of you. Boom! Crack shot. I had enough fun for one day. I'll hand that it back over to JC. George, go find an Impala. Yeah. yeah, your job to find it, your job to kill it, my job to cook it. Easy. Good. We head out on foot. JC tells me that although Impala are large in number, we have to be very careful not to startle them. Otherwise, there's no dinner for later. We've got to be very quiet because they're very skittish. So this one is uh, Impala tracks. Okay, mm -hmm. and it's next to the buffalo tracks. So you never really want to run into a buffalo when you're on foot. He's got a big gun, we'll be all right. Eagle-eyes George thinks he's spotted a culprit. Keep seeing us and running. No, they smelled us, yeah. I'll tell you what, this is not as easy as I thought it was going to be. We'll have to just try and skirt around them in a very wide arc, which involves a lot of walking. And he's in here somewhere. Eventually, JC sees two Impala hiding in the thick bush and ready for the taking. <laughs> Cracking shot. Dinner is served. It's always difficult to sort of digest the idea that you've got to kill something. But I mean, you can't eat it when it's alive. And you want to eat things, they've got to die. Good work. Good. It wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. No. George, eagle eyes, well done, man. I'm very, very happy with our catch. Nearby, the reserve has a dressing room. So George and JC helped me to prepare the Impala for my bush meal, which I know is going to be awesome. The ingredients I have collected are terrific. Now, it's just a case of combining them with this amazing impala meat for George and Judy. Here's that absolutely beautiful impala. George has very kindly removed its legs for me, and what we have is a sort of torso. We also have these wonderful berries, our white berries, and the little purple berries. Both these berries are very, very sweet, but they have large seeds in them that are actually quite bitter, so I just need to work around that. George, can you help me? Yeah. Good man, yeah, boy. You've got your ribs here, which you can see. This muscle here is what's commonly known as ribeye in the cow world. And then behind that is the sirloin. The ribs stop right where the fillet more or less starts. I'm just going to concentrate on the ribs and the ribeye. Portion the impala to separate the different cuts from the rib cage. That's it. If you cut through there, you get beautiful chops. Very, very easy. It's good, George. Thank you very much. I'll just get on with this now. Trim these into what we call double chops. Two bones per chop so that you have a slightly thicker chop. Look at that meat. Just fantastic. Good old Farney from the butcher's shop gave me some of his biltong spice. Coat the double impala chops with the biltong spice and marinate for anything up to an hour. If you don't have biltong spice, a combination of coriander seed, salt, pepper, and vinegar will do. Impala is going to be cooked in one of these bad boys. And you'll find these all over this country. They're called poikis. You just dump in the fire, throw everything in it, and just let it cook, take it off, and off you go. Into your poiki goes a knob of butter and a mixture of finely chopped red onions, celery, and carrots. Then add some sprigs of oregano and rosemary, black pepper, chopped garlic, and baby shallots. Try lemon zest for an extra twang. To thicken the sauce, a can of whole tomatoes and a heavy glug of red wine. No need to be stingy here. My impala chops have been marinating in this very strong biltong spice for quite a bit. If you have a look at this, Judy, you can see how... No, oh, it's soaking in. George, come check this out. Starting to take out the liquid. Smells good, huh? Mm. 
I think that'll go very well to make a very sort of rich stew. First, rinse off the biltong spice from the chops, then heat up a splash of olive oil and sear the chops to get a lovely brown color. These go into my poiki, chop side down. The reason I kept those bones nice and long, so I can almost line the inside of the poiki with the ribs. So it really looks like a witch's brew. Let me cover this, because these need a bit of cooking time. So what I'm going to do now is get into these berries. The problem with them both is the seeds are quite bitter. So I need to get rid of them. So the plan is to make a sort of chutney slash jam. Throw the white and purple berries into a heated pan and let them cook down. I'm assuming they'll just disintegrate and we'll be able to strain off the pulp and leave the seeds behind. What do you think, Judy? I think it'll work. I think it's a great idea. Add some water and cover your pan to let the berries steam in their own juices for a couple of minutes. What I have here is JC's favorite bit of an impala, beautiful liver and the kidneys. And these are going to go into the poiki as well. Liver and kidney are the most wonderful things in the entire world. And if you don't eat them, you're missing out. Coat the liver and kidneys with some of the biltong spice and fry them off. You like the liver, huh? Very good. I put a bit more water into these berries because they weren't behaving themselves. I want to sort of strain them and force the, the liquid and the pulp as much as I can through it and keep the seeds out. To finish the berry marmalade, heat some maple syrup with some lemon zest. Then add the strained berry juice. It's quite bitter, so it should complement the syrup perfectly. What do we call this again? Um, Hemizagia. Bet you won't find that in the supermarket. It's sort of a wild basil lemon, very aromatic flavor. In there, and you just need to let that cook off. That is what we call an experiment. It doesn't look bad though, does it? Not at all. Just hope it thickens up, You yeah. probably need some time for it to set. Absolutely, yeah. I'm now sautéing the wild spinach we collected with some butter and seasoning. I've got these absolutely beautiful portobello mushrooms. Just going to take the stalks out, a little bit of olive oil on the top of them, salt, pepper. Not that much pepper. And then on the grill. George, do you like mushrooms? Good. We're just going to get a nice sear on the one side of the mushroom, get some lovely flavor into it. Now, what I want to do is get my kidney and liver into that little nest that I made, just in the top there, like that. So that's the idea. Perfectly. Spinach is looking very good as well. I'm just going to get a little bit of spinach on top of each mushroom. And I can't wait to get stuck into this spinach because it just looks intriguing. George, you hungry? So let's eat. My Impala meat poiki smells incredible and will be a treat with the wild spinach covered mushrooms and berry marmalade. The ideal meal to have in this beautiful reserve. Get stuck in the way for me. I'm going to try the mushroom and spinach first. Mm. It's so delicious. It's kind of got that coarseness to yeah, it. Yeah, it does have. And it's creamy all on its own. Chutney's not bad. Mm. Goes nicely with the liver. What do you think? Yeah. You're happy with that, huh? Yeah. Very good. And the empire is just delicious. It's not too gamey. It's just like perfect venison. You do get the coriander and, you know, you get the richness of the biltong spice. It's a fantastic, fantastic meat. Do this. Much easier. <laughs> and thanks to JC. If it wasn't for him and his deadly accurate shooting, we would not be here. Thank you very much, Judy. It's been absolutely awesome. Wanyabwonga, good man. I still can't forget about that wonderful biltong. So before I go back to the restaurant, I'm visiting another butchery to collect a biltong curio that is hard to find. Biltong is regularly chopped and sold, but what gets left behind in the machines is also intriguing. It's called biltong dust. And basically all it is is the bits, bits of biltong that fly off the blade and get left in here. Do you ever use this stuff in seasoned food or anything like that? Think about this and a bit of cream cheese with some nachos. Oh, very nice. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. So I'm just going to collect a load of this out of Ron's machines, stick it in a bowl, take it back with me to Nairobi, and I'm going to think about what I can do with it. Perfect. Good. All right, Ron, thank you very much, mate. Thank Cheers. you very much. <laughs> I'm now heading back to the restaurant in Nairobi, Kenya to cook up a bizarre combo with this extremely tasty biltong dust. I'm going to stuff a whole rock cod with a creamy biltong dust mousse and cap off the dish with some polenta chips. If you don't have biltong dust, you can use finely chopped pepperoni. So we're just back from the low felt where we had an absolutely fantastic time, that wonderful impala, which was just delicious. And then, of course, this biltong dust is fantastic and it is a wonderful seasoning. So you might be wondering, well, there's a fish sitting in front of me. Where I am in this part of the world, in Kenya, you're not actually allowed to cook game meat, so we couldn't bring any impala back with us. And I just wanted to show how versatile this biltong dust is. And I don't think many people will have put biltong dust and fish together. The fish I've got in front of me here is a wonderful sea fish called rock cod. It's quite meaty and white. Any good white fish will work in this recipe. So what I'm going to do first, actually, is I want to kind of keep the fish whole, but filleted at the same time. So we kind of create a little pocket there. I've kept the head and the tail on actually break out the bone like that. Those are going to go in here to create a little bit of fish stock. All I've got in there is lemon and water. I got no bones. I got no bones. Set on a plate, back in the fridge. So what I'm going to do now is actually create a stuffing or a mousse 
So you're into that fish to replace the bones. Add 200 grams of cream cheese, the belly of salmon, and some orange and lemon zest. For an extra kick, throw in one finely chopped red bullet chili. Then, some roasted garlic, and now you're ready for the star of the show. Four tablespoons of built-on dust. Whisk until smooth and creamy. Couple more things in there. Beautiful bit of dill. And the other thing I've got here is a smoked chili paste we make in the restaurant. Salt and pepper. Done. Roll out a sheet of cling film big enough for your fish. Stuff the cod with some raw spinach before adding your mousse. You're trying to recreate the shape of the cod without the bones. This is a great party dish. I'm gonna bring out a whole fish, impress all your friends. They all go, wow, you're amazing. You say thank you very much. Feed them, they all love you. It's one of those dishes. I've got this pan here. I'm just gonna gently place the fish in it and poach the fish for a good 20 minutes. Slow cooking. So I'm just gonna make some very simple polenta chips to go with my fish. Heat up equal quantities of water and cream. Throw in a knob of butter and season with salt and pepper. Little chef is running around the kitchen like that. As the creamy mix comes to the boil, slowly add your polenta flour, whisking while you do so. Then chuck in cream cheese and a handful of parmesan. Hot into this dish here. Just flatten it out nicely. Probably an inch thick, so that when you turn it out and you cut it into chips, you get nice square chips. Caraway seed, very, very strong stuff, but so, so delicious. Mustard seed, we all know it looks pretty. Will give a lovely crunch. Those seeds will roast in the oil and you will get the flavor there. Set your polenta aside to cool. Now, sauce for this whole dish. Fire. Toast a quarter teaspoon of caraway seeds in a pan. They are powerful. Add a pinch of black pepper and some butter. As soon as you throw that butter in there, you get that beautiful aroma of the caraway straight away. Throw in half of a finely chopped white onion and a teaspoon of diced garlic. Just sweat them off in that butter. In there, that's the heads and the shells of the prawns. There is so much flavor in these things, it is a crime to throw them away. All we want here is the flavor, not the actual prawns. That smells absolutely incredible. Cognac. And we burn our eyebrows. Finally, add a slug of cream, some freshly chopped parsley, and the codfish stock. Season with salt. Just let that cook away, then we'll let it reduce. It'll get nice and thick, and we'll be ready. For your cool polenta, you want to portion it into chunky chips. So you can just see there, that beautiful caraway and mustard seed is just set in nicely. And when we deep fry those, we're really gonna release the flavors. So just to get my sauce ready, I'm cooking away beautifully. I'm just gonna strain these prawn heads off like this, and crush it, so we get a lot of flavor out of it. That goes back on the heat, so we're just gonna reduce that, thicken it up, and really intensify the flavor. Next, for that wonderful rock cod, carefully peel off the cling film and stand it up on a board. If you don't have a board that will let you do this, you can just lay it flat. Low torch. Whoa. All we need to do here is get some color on this skin. Nice crispy skin, you gotta love it. Now to finish the sauce, throw in a teaspoon of chopped capers and a pinch of fresh parsley. The sauce is really thickened up and intensified. Absolutely delicious. I'm gonna get that sauce around the base of my fish here. That is looking absolutely beautiful. My rock cod is literally gonna swim in an ocean of this amazing sauce, and my polenta chips complement it perfectly. A British, French, and South African crossover, what a combo. We've got this beautiful rock cod stuffed with the cream cheese and that biltong dust, the key ingredient. Lovely polenta chips to go with it, add a bit of texture to sop, mop up this wonderful prawn sauce. I think that dish is gonna be a winner. And that biltong dust in there, I think is gonna add an absolutely incredible flavor. Oi, chain to eat it, but it's the only way. Have you ever eaten biltong dust in a fish? No. Nope. Me neither. It looks absolutely beautiful, the spinach in there, the stuffing. Best time. Best time, is it? I love rock cod because it's such a meaty fish. The mousse is very delicate and you've got a wonderful meaty fish with it. The good thing about using cream cheese is it's almost got a lemony taste to it. Chili in there is popping through beautifully. The biltong dust has flavored that. It's just given it a really subtle saltiness that, you know, when you put bacon into things. It's done exactly the same thing. Anthony, come try this. Come in here, Speedy. That mousse is delicious. Go on, get stuck in. What do you lot think? Good. Delicious. Yes. And we found all sorts of really awesome food out in the low felt there. Wild berries, the impala, really fantastic. We managed to bring home a South African staple, a household staple, and stuff it into a fish. And I think it's worked out really, really well. This is an absolutely delicious dish, and I'm very happy. You will find all my recipes for this series, including alternative suggestions for the more unusual ingredients, at www.24kitchen.com.